All right, welcome to week four. Um, we're halfway through the first half, so a quarter of the way through the semester. Um, today we're going to top, tackle logical and physical diagramming. It's actually a fairly straightforward forward topic. Um, it just follows naturally from what we did last week. So um, before we dive into the diagramming thing, let's do a quick uh, refresher about keys. You should have learned most of this last semester, but I've learned not to assume. So I'm going to go over these different keys automatically quickly. Primary key. It's a key used to identify a row in a table uniquely. If you need to find a row, the primary key is what you're going to use to find it. A foreign key. It's a key in a table that you use to enforce something called referential integrity between two or more tables. A compound key, it's a key made up of two or more columns. A surrogate key. Now, some of you may not have heard this called surrogate. You may have heard it called a synthetic key. A surrogate key is an artificial key that's used as a primary key and the database server determines its value. It has no real world meaning. And here's the nifty thing. A key can be a combination of any of the above. A primary key could be a compound key that's made up of one or more foreign keys. It may even have a synthetic key in there while it's added too. There's basically put, there's no real limitation of what a key can be. It's what it does. That's important. Um, so yeah, you can have a compound key where values come from an external source. Um, through being a foreign key. All right. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about keys because this is kind of important. Um, I actually used to have like four slides on this topic and I realized really I only needed the one because uh, this covers the important part. All right. First, I'm going to talk about natural keys. So just so you know, a natural key is a key that gets its value from the data itself. In other words, it relates to something, quote unquote, real. Email address, social insurance number, passport number, student visa number. Those are things you could use as a key. And they're called natural keys because they come from a real world source. Natural keys have um, a few pros. It reduces the number of columns by one but it reduces the number of columns um, and it's meaningful. As in other words, somebody sees what the key, the value in the key is, and it makes sense to whoever's using the system. Um, now, those two pros come from database designers from the 70s, 80s, early 90s. 90% um, 90 to 95% of modern database designers do not think that's a pro, just so you know. Um, but you'll always, no matter where you go to work, eventually you'll come across that old fart that it's the things the right way. Then you start arguing. Um, and I know about arguing with them because I've done it many times in my career. So cons of a natural key, they can be complex. They can be slow. Usually they're slow because they're complex. For example, an email address. People think that's not complicated data. Yeah, it's strings, special characters, and it's long. Text-based keys are slow because when you're trying to look something up, it's gonna go, if you go, you know, even use my first name as a key. All right, first letter D. Look through everything that's a D. Oh, next letter is an A. Then it looks through everything that's an A. Then it looks for the N and the I and the E and the L. And then if we're going to keep going with my email address, dot, you know, G, A, U, and eventually, but it's got to do it from left to right. It takes a long time to do it. It's difficult to update. In this modern day, how many of you have had the exact same email address your entire life? 
one, two. You just think you've only had that. How many school email addresses have you had? You never have an email address in school back while you were in high school? No? Okay. Some yes, some no. Okay. Cool. What happens if your email address changes and you're using it as a primary key? You end up with a chicken before the egg problem. How do you put a value in if there's already a value, but you can't change the value if the value is already there? And then if you're using it as a foreign key, what do you do with the foreign keys? That means you got to change the children without changing the parent, but you can't change the child because the parent's not there yet. It's terrible. Um, it can lead to privacy and security issues. Okay, we decide we're going to use people's SIN number as their primary key. Uh, Script Kitty managed to get a hold of your database. Congrats. They got identifying data for you. Same thing with visa numbers, passport numbers. They've got driver's license numbers. They're real world and it's stuff people quote unquote understand. And then somebody gets a dump of the database and the, you know, they're having lots of fun at your expense at that point. Um, yeah. So that kind of data is just not safe to use as a key for obvious reasons. In Canada, the number of people getting new social insurance numbers has gone up over the last 15, 20 years. Anybody want to take a guess? Why? Somebody's had their identity stolen. So their SIN number is now in the wild. Somebody's gotten a hold of their SIN number and they can no longer do things because their SIN number says they're bankrupt, even though they never opened up a single bank loan because somebody you know, opened up a bunch of stuff against them. Step one of the process, you go to a Service Canada desk and you apply for a new SIN number. Now all your old records don't exist and don't belong to you anymore. Just stay away from natural keys, please. Surrogate keys, on the other hand, they are fast on searches and joins. Why? Because it's usually a number. And what are computers good at? Numbers. Right? I mean, 8 bits will hold a big number. It has no business meaning. And, you know, if you notice on the pro con of the natural keys, it says that it's meaningful as a pro. The fact it has no business meaning is actually also good because who cares what the value of the primary key is the only time the primary key happens quote unquote has meaning is in systems where the primary key is used as say an order number an invoice number a customer number but even then a lot of systems will generate two numbers one for the record and one that's public so that there's no direct link between the, the actual raw record and the data Surrogate keys don't care about privacy issues. Why? Because the number means nothing. Well, it means that it's a record, but it means nothing in the real world. You're 55. Number 55, what does that mean? 73 means nothing. Absolutely nothing in the real world. On the other hand, the database cares a lot. So the fact that, you know, your number 55 has no privacy issues because it just it has no privacy issues because it doesn't mean anything. Okay, cons. Has no business meaning. That's the old guy, the old farts complaining about how these numbers don't have any meaning. It has more data in indexes. That one is valid. Because if you add a synthetic key, you have one more column. The primary keys are always indexed automatically. That means you have one more index, which means you're adding at least three more write operations every time you write a record. So there's a little more data, a little more stuff getting written to the disk. But that being said, the benefits far outweigh these things. Now, if we go back to the 80s and the 70s, that made a big difference when we were talking hard drives in the size of, you know, a big hard drive was 10 megabytes, you know, like three pictures from my phone was the entire contents of the hard drive and the entire corporation was running on that. Yeah, you know what? Adding that extra column those extra indexes meant a lot. So natural keys were made sense. Nowadays, if we have a computer that's 
say you got a terabyte hard drive and the index is occupying 10k of the disk it literally the windows file system is actually going to use up more disk space to see that there's a file there than the actual contents of the file it's just kind of cool and then you know people complain they're ugly because they're numbers whatever so after this slide you can guess which side of the argument i fall on uh i'm a big fan of surrogate keys uh, I've been doing database design for 26, 27 years. And I originally did try to use natural keys because that's what I was taught when I went to school. And uh, I discovered really quickly it was a really stupid idea. Uh, the only, actually, let me back up. There is, so far in my career, I've seen two sources of data that make good natural keys. Can anybody take a guess what those two things might be? So in my career, I've only seen two sources of natural keys that actually make sense to be used. God, no. How many phone numbers have you had in your life? Just the one. So you've had a cell phone, you have a landline at your parents' house. But they had one at one point. Therefore, you had more than one number. No. Because how many people are born on the same day? What's this? The barcode number. Every barcode is unique for each product. Usually, barcode numbers are safe. And the other one that's fairly safe is um, the product codes that you see at the grocery store for produce, because those are industry standard. 4011, non-organic bananas. It goes into the system, and if it's uh, 40111, those are organic bananas, just so you know. That's the only one I remember. Everything else I have to look up every time I check out. But those are industry standard. Those numbers are set by a governing body. Therefore, every grocery store in Canada and in the U.S., and probably a lot of other places in the world, all use 4011 for non-organic bananas. That's safe to use because it's just a number that someone decided was going to be unique for bananas. That's it. Those are the two I've seen that so far in my career that are valid. Uh, barcodes are used often because, well, stores, retail, right? A store will not have the same barcode twice in their products database because every product has a unique barcode. So that's why that one's fairly safe. All right, that takes care of keys for physical design. Resolving complex relationships. All right, when converting a conceptual diagram to a logical and or physical diagram, uh, there's a specific type of relationship that needs to be resolved. Many to many relationships are physically impossible to implement in an actual database. They make sense at the conceptual stage where you're thinking about how things are related. But when it's time to apply them physically to a database, I've only seen two database products in my entire career that allows many to many to happen in the software. Neither of those products still exist. So it gives you an idea how good idea it is. Um, you resolve a many, many relationship by creating an either something called an intersection table or an associative entity or an associative table and i'll be talking about those in a moment um to give you an idea why it's bad there's ways to get away with doing many to many just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it but a way of doing it would be to create a one-to-many relationship from table one to table two and then create a one-to-many relationship from table two back to table one and let me tell you why that's a really stupid idea so when I first started working in Ottawa, so that would have been 1997, um, I inherited a really strange database. I was working for a company, Digital Equipment, and um, I had a manager approach me and go, hey, uh, we have this database and we're trying to clean it up, but we're having a really hard time. And since you're the database export expert, you know, in our division, 
I was like three years out of school, so I was an expert. He goes, I, I'm wondering if you can take care of this for you. I'm like, okay, cool. Okay, I look at the data, I'm like, this is really strange. And all they were trying to do is just get rid of a couple of rows of data they didn't need anymore. I deleted the first row. Now, think of this back in the old days. You know, I had a Pentium 2 computer with, I think, 256 megabytes of RAM. Not gigs, megs of RAM. And my computer just started going mechanical hard drive. And I could hear the hard drive just going and going and going. And I'm like, wow, this is taking a long time. I had a slow database. After about five minutes, I'm going, wait, something's gone horribly wrong. I kill the command. I open up the database and 80% of the table is gone. Why? Because it started deleting here. Oh, this one was a parent of this one. So it was cascading, deleting between the two tables. And in the end, uh, over 80% of the rows were related to each other. So basically put, it looked like a family from Kentucky where everybody was related to everybody else. I had a backup. Um, what I discovered is I had to kill the foreign keys. Then I could clean it up and then I had to recreate the foreign keys. But the problem was at that point was, take a guess, the keys are broken. Relationships are gone. That didn't fix the problem. I still had a backup. My answer to the problem was, we're not, we're not doing this today. And yeah. You can set rules to allow it to auto-cascade. Yeah. Update. Yeah, on, on delete, cascade. And instead of setting null or do nothing, it will cascade and delete the child. So then the child got needed to delete its parent, its child. And it was going, pew, pew, pew. But suddenly you had a child that was actually a parent of one that you already tried to delete. And then suddenly everything was just going like this. Actually, I was really impressed that the software actually managed to delete that much because I thought it was just going to blow up. So that's why you don't do many to many in the database. It's just not going to happen well. So what you do is if you have a conceptual diagram that shows entity A having a many to many relationship to entity B, you end up with the following setup. Entity A, entity B, also known as table A, table B that both point to a table in the middle. That table is known as an intersect table or an associative table or a junction table on depending on who taught you SQL. Um, the, the, the correct term is intersect, an intersect table or uh, associative table. And there's a reason why I'm using two different words. And I'm about to explain why now. So when, a junction table is the same thing as an intersection table, just so that, you know, you have something to relate what you may have heard previously. An intersect table contains two columns. The primary keys of the parent tables that act as a compound key. So I'm actually going to put it on the board. You guys have something a little more visual. So if you've got table A and the primary key, key is AID, you got table B and its ID is BID. Okay, so these are the PKs. So you end up with a child table and you call it whatever the heck you want. I'm gonna call it AB. And in here you'll have AID and B, I, D, these are both primary key and they happen to be foreign keys. Like such. That's a junction table and an intersect table. I mean, you may have seen them last semester. I don't know if the prof brought up these kinds of tables or not. But this is a is known as an intersect table or a junction table. These, um, are fine, they do the job. They're not that great anymore because of modern data governance rules. Uh, there's a lot of things this is not great for. Um, so can anybody take a guess why this might be have problems with data governance rules? 
So for you, for those of you that don't know what a data governance rule is, it's, it's a rule that says you always know who touched the data and what did they do? And when did it happen? What does this table not have? Well, it has a primary key because it's a compound key. It, the relationship is the foreign key, so the primary key to the foreign key. So these are PKs. These are PKs. The PKs feed into the, the, the composite count primary key. So remember earlier I was talking about how a key can be a primary key, a foreign key, a compound key? Inter that's what intersect tables do. The problem with this for data governance concepts is you don't know who touched the data. You don't know when they touched the data. There's not enough columns. And the second you add more columns, it's no longer a junction table or an intersect table. It's a associative entity. And the associative entity, if we were going to do this the proper modern way, is we'd have a... Uh, a created date, we'd have a uh, created by, and we'd have a bunch of other columns on here to track who did it, when did they do it. And what happens if uh, this relationship is no longer valid, and then a little bit later becomes valid again? You delete it, you lost the history, you recreate it, you've got history again. Intersect tables are pretty much, you know, the concept of an intersect table by itself is dead. We all use associative entities now with all the extra stuff. Um, so usually an associative entity will contain the primary keys of the parents. So it'll always have the foreign keys of the parents, but often the associative entities at that point start having a synthetic key because it gets too complicated. Because what happens if we need to keep track of this relationship, but it can be created multiple times. That means we have to have multiple the created dates part of the primary key. So we have a three-part primary key, and that gets slow, so we create a synthetic key. Um, another example you'd see of this would be like an order, an order line. You have an order. Each item in the order line usually relates to a product, so you're associating a product to an order, and then you have a quantity and a price and a, you know, blah, blah, blah. And suddenly you have extra columns on your intersect table. So now it becomes an associative entity. They're both valid. Um, I've actually created a few databases with intersection tables even recently for applications that did not require data governance for specific things. Um, I've got some co-op students at work right now that, you know, I'm trying to explain this concept to them because they didn't learn it. Um, good job, Carlton. Sorry. So that's the difference between the two. Just basically put, assume that you're working with associative entities because the odds are that junction's gonna have more than, more, than, more than just two columns in it. That's all. Okay, so a logical versus a physical diagram. And so far, you guys heard about conceptual diagrams. That's the one with the boxes and the diamonds and the ovals. Now, logical and physical diagrams are really, really similar. They're almost identical. Often database designers will skip the logical diagram outright because they usually design for a specific platform. And the whole point of the conceptual diagram, the logical diagram is that it's generic. You design so that it can be ported to multiple platforms. Um, so similarities, they have tables, they have relationships, they have columns, data types. It's a database diagram. However, <clears throat> some logical diagrams um, may allow the existence of many to many relationships and that sentence is really bad. Um, so logical diagrams may allow the existence of many to many. It depends on what software you're using. I usually tend to go with the whole side of, they don't allow it unless the software allows you to do it. Um, but you know, just should avoid that anyways. Uh, physical diagrams do not allow many to many. Like 
You just can't do it. Um, there's, there, I've seen some physical design software that lets you create the many to many relationship. But when you go to export it, it gives you an error saying you got to resolve them. Makes sense because they can't exist physically in the database. Therefore, you got to resolve it, and that's how they do it. Um, logical diagrams will use generic data types. Physical diagrams will use engine specific data types. So, generic data types. Sam was ready for this slide. A generic data type would be a car, a VAR car. So, I don't know how much you learned about data types last semester for database. Uh, probably if you looked at a diagram, you probably saw a variety of data types. So generic. The generic means that they pretty much exist in every database server, one way or another. Um, they might be called something slightly different, but they exist. So a car or a character field is a fixed length field. So if you define something as car 10, Use the board again. If you define something as car 10, and this is one that throws a lot of people for a loop. Okay, car 10. This is a character field that allows 10 characters. Seems obvious, right? But here's what's not obvious. It will always use 10 bytes of data. You put in the letter A, it's 10 bytes. You put in A, B, C, D, E, F, H, I, J, J. That's also 10. What it does is it will pad with spaces. So it's always 10 long. Now, some people would think, why the heck would you even want that? Back to the 70s, okay? In the 70s and early 80s, computers were really, really slow. It might shock you just how slow they were compared to today. They are really slow. It's amazing what they managed to do with those things. But the advantage of the CAR-10 is it actually made retrieving records faster because the database software always knew how much it needed to, how much space it needed to access on the media. Think about the old tape-to-tape -tape systems. The operating system says, I need 10 bytes. It would know exactly how many milliliter, milliliters, millimeters of tape it needed to move to move 10 bytes. It, it's actually allowed it to physically optimize because it knew exactly how much room to move. On the hard drives, it knew it needed to move the head so many sectors to get all 10 bytes. So it could optimize the read-write operations because it knew it was the next column would always be this far away from this current column performance by physical design. Um, that's a consideration modern database designers don't think about anymore because does the SSD really care about where things are and how long it takes it to read it? Not. So as a side effect of the car data type though, data got fat. Why? Because the letter A takes up 10 bytes. A through J also takes up 10 bytes. This is wasting nine bytes of space. Again, 20 megabyte hard drives, 10 megabyte hard drives. Uh, when I did my co-op in college, the company I worked for ran an old System 36 computer from IBM. Uh, the processing unit was half again the size of that table. Like it was a table where the monitor and the keyboard sat on top, but that was the computer. The hard drive was a 30 megabyte hard drive from IBM. That big. It was slow. But it was a thing. That hard drive was $75,000. In They bought it like late 80s. So today dollars, it's probably like $150,000 for... No, 30 megabytes. Just think about that number. So some data scientists says, we can do better than this. So they invented something called VARCAR, also known as variable character length fields. So if we took a VARCAR field, so, you know, 
at the Varkar field, A would occupy one byte plus a little bit of something. I don't, the, uh, different database engines do it differently. So that's why I say a little bit of something. Uh, they'll put in a special binary character here that says, this is the end of the field. You're done reading now. So it'll read till it sees this byte, this little combination of bits on the disk and it goes, oh, good, next field. And so that means it will always occupy up to 10, but it only use what it needs more or less. Now, the problem back in the day was that VAR cars were slower than car fields because it didn't know how much it needed to move the head. So it always had to look for that termination character. That's cool and all. Um, modern database systems, um, there's no disk speed difference. Like there's no noticeable difference at all. Uh, the modern guidance is just use VAR car. <laughs> Unless you have a really good reason to use a car, like you're going to put in a postal code, Canadian postal code. There are always six characters. You're always going to have six characters. So you could use a car because then you're going to save that last, you know, three bits at the end or whatever it is. So use a VAR car whenever you can. Text fields. That lets you put in a lot of text. Shocking, eh? Like lots. Um, some database servers call it something different. For example, Microsoft products call it a memo field. Uh, Oracle calls it a clob, character large object. It's just, you know, what it calls it. Um, Postgres calls, calls it a text. Um, the limitation on text fields depends on the database engine, but if I use Postgres as an example, it'll hold, um, Basically put until you run out of disk space in a single field. It just lets you put in whatever you want. Um, shouldn't, but you can put whatever you want in it. The, you have date and date time. I think those are pretty self-explanatory. You have a date field. You have a date field plus it's time. Um, different database servers, again, do this slightly differently. Oracle only has date because apparently date also includes time. And you have to do stupid stuff if you just want the date part. Um, numeric decimal. A numeric and decimal is one of the clever data types. Um, some system will call it numeric, some will call them decimal. They're interchangeable. It's the same thing. Um, normally, it's what you use for things like money. Because if I go numeric, Six comma two. You'll notice there's two numbers in the parentheses. Length precision. So this means I can store six digits. Two are reserved for decimal places. So this is the six. This is the two. Which is fantastic for money because you can have a maximum size total number of digits. If you don't have any decimal places, in theory, you can get more in. But numeric and decimals have a very fixed style, which often I'll get students say, well, why can't we just use a float? Do you need practically infinite decimal places for money? No. Why would you waste the space on the disk and the extra processing to deal with it? Floats and doubles are expensive compared to decimals and numerics. Last but not least, we have integers. Everybody in here knows what an integer is, right? I mean, I've had cases where I had students go, what do you mean, what's an integer? I just want to leave screaming. Um, the thing is that most database servers have multiple flavors of integers. You'll have a small integer, an integer, a big integer. And all that is is just how much how big can the integer be? Um, actually, let me pull up a web page real quick. Uh, da, da, da. All right. Oh, yeah. And my skills got something called tiny int. So, a big integer, um, they use a uh, 
an exponent to express how big it is. Um, let me just okay, let me just go grab one that's actually a little better. Um, no, that's not it. This. Okay. Hey. That's a big integer. It's it's a really big number. And MySQL uses about this uh, uses about the same size. Uh, the cool thing about MySQL is you can make it unsigned, so you can actually get one more digit of precision on there. So your number becomes, you know, even larger. Um okay, so those are the generic types. We've got platform specific ones. And Varkar, you will find in Microsoft products. It stands for, and I think Oracle's got it too. It's it stands for uh, national nationalized Varkar. Means that it will hold things other than you no know, regular Latinate characters without using up extra room. So for those of us that use Latin alphabets, you might be shocked that Chinese, Japanese, Korean have really complicated, uh, they're not alphabets. They are uh, character systems. And whereas we can express pretty much every Latinate letter with one byte, sometimes, you know, one byte usually covers pretty much everything, including accents and omlauts and all that fun stuff. The we had to create they had to create special code pages just for Chinese. Originally it was called Big Eight. And now we have UTF eight, UTF sixteen, UTF thirty two, because the Asian languages I shouldn't just pick on the Chinese, because most all the Asian languages do this, they have a lot of characters and they run out of space. Yes. To contain them. So most Asian languages use four bytes for each character. So if you were doing the Varkar, the old school Varkar, if you wanted to put in a single Asian character, you'd have to define it as a Varkar 4 because it needed four bytes to store. They created N Varkar, so you can go N Varkar 1, it'll hold the letter A, it'll hold, also hold the moon rune that talks about the dragon flying over the sky while it takes the crap in the lake. See, I didn't pick in a specific language on that one, but you know, they basically got lots of adjustments for their different characters. And it occupies the same amount of space in the database. Timestamp. Timestamp is odd. In Postgres, timestamp is a date time with time zone. Hmm. In MySQL, it's a date time that automatically sets itself when the record gets created. To me, the word timestamp doesn't mean the same thing in all places. Uh, text. Notice it's showing up again as a platform specific. Because MySQL, being MySQL, decided to make things hard. They got tiny text, text, and big text. And it just limits, tells you how much can fit in it depending on the size you need. Everybody else just has text. Booleans. And you'll notice that MySQL is special. Because MySQL does not have Booleans. MySQL used to use something called TinyInt. And literally, it, now that's been deprecated, so MySQL is even more special now. Um, so in MySQL, if you want to do a Boolean in a MySQL, you'd use TinyInt1. Now at least you're not allowed to put a 1 on TinyInt. So this meant that in MySQL, you had one through nine flavors of true. So zero was false and one through nine was, honey, what do you want to have for supper tonight? And then you get nine different answers, right? That was, that's bad because it's not a real Boolean. It's just a number that we're saying, hey, we're only going to store zero and one in this. But by the way, if we really want to, we can put in two because it's more true. Uh, nowadays, 
we have, we're not allowed to do this anymore in MySQL, which means we now have one to 255 flavors of true, but that's okay because nobody needs real booleans. Everybody else has got booleans, <laughs> just so you know. That's a MySQL special. And there's tons of other platform specific data types. <clears throat> um, Microsoft and Oracle and Postgres all offer uh, geometric data types. Microsoft and Oracle make you pay for it. Postgres gives it to you for free. Um, for you, for those of you that aren't sure what that means, is I can actually store a circle in the database. I give it X, I actually store X, Y, R. So with X, Y, R, you know where the circle is and how big it is. You just store the three sets of coordinates and it tells you exactly where the circle is and how big it is. You do the same thing with squares and triangles and polygons. And some of you might be thinking, why would you even want to store that in the database? Anybody in here ever hear the acronym GIS? Geographical Information Systems. How do you think maps are stored in a database? Geometric primitives. One of my jobs a long time ago, that's probably about 16 years ago, we actually did some GIS for a client. It was, uh, there, our client was, uh, I don't remember, Praxis, I think it was. And it was there in Alberta and they were planning a big uh, electric, uh, electrical grid replacement system and they wanted a way to contact everybody in certain areas because they were gonna have trucks coming through. So they didn't know the address of people that were impacted. So we'd say, okay, draw the primitive on the map and we'll tell you everybody who lives in that box. And you know, you can do it with those kinds of systems. Um, Postgres has some other cool ones. Um, it's got um, networking data types. So you can store an IP address in it. Everybody says, well, why can't you just put that in a text field? In the text field, you can't actually query the actual octet. You can store a MAC address. So you can actually go based on the piece of the MAC address and look up for records. Um, Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server has it too. And Postgres now also has JSON data types, which means you can store JSON directly in the database. And Postgres does the best. You can actually query specific lease of the JSON as part of your where clause. For those of you that don't know what, what's so cool about that is, I'm sure you've heard the phrase NoSQL, MongoDB, Redis, blah, blah, blah. Postgres lets you do it inside of a relational database, eliminating the whole point of these products. Um, yeah, and there's others. Like, I mean, if you go looking at all the different data types, Postgres has got some like 92 different data types. They got a data type for everything. Microsoft SQL Server pretty close behind it too. Was that? Okay. You don't. We have a data type called blob. Binary large object. Say no to blobs. They have very specific uses and storing images is not it. What you do is you upload the image to the server, you save it on the disk and you save the file name and the path in the database in a varchar field. And usually the question up is why would, you, why, why would you not store the image in the database? Okay, a database record, 2K. That's the whole record, okay? That's actually a pretty fat record, by the way, 2K. I'm going to store a um, a picture from my phone. And okay, now my record is 3 megabytes plus 2K. Still doesn't sound that big. I've got a million images in my database. How big is your table now? Three megabytes times one million rows divided by 1024 divided by 1024. Nope. Nope. Damn. Okay. One million. One million times three megabytes divided by 1024. Your table's sitting at two point nine gigabytes. And when it's time, when I would talk about backups in the, after the break, like after the reading week, 
you got to back up one table at three gigabytes just for that table. In the meantime, if you've got the files on the disk, if I go one million rows times 3K, 2.86 megabytes is all it needs to store the same thing. And the disk is taking care of the images for you. So yes, don't store images in the database. Um, it's like if you ate McDonald's every day and never took a poop. Um, that having been said, there is a place. <laughs> I just made him lose it. <laughs> but hey, it's a good visual, right? You absolutely see what I'm talking about by using these horrible examples. Um, but that having been said, there is a purpose for blobs. It's when you need to store data in the database in its native format. That means you don't want to convert it to text. Um, an often used method for this is for translations. You will use a blob field to hold the translation because some database servers only allow certain character sets. So you define a table and it's going to be using Windows 1252, Latin 1, or UTF-8. UTF-8 is not the standard, so it's not as much of a problem as it used to be. But what happens if your string stored in Latin, but then you try to shove, I don't know, Japanese characters into that field? It's not going to work. It's like you're actually going to get errors because they can't. So you'd use a blob field where you'd store the raw values of the characters instead. So then you can just read it and convert it to whatever the person's trying to read by setting the you know, appropriate things in the application or in the browser. Another purpose for it is if you need to store raw binary data of a sort, for example, place I was working at, we wrote printer drivers. And the cool part was, is that we actually stored our printer drivers in the database. Not the drivers themselves, the code that creates the driver. So we can take a driver for Epson, clone it, and then reuse most of the driver def definition to create a new driver. So creating new drivers was really fast. Normally, these would be things like, most of you don't realize how printers talk, how your computer talks to your printer. It will send instructions and then random special characters like, um, the bell character. Did you know it's actually an ASCII character that makes your computer go ding? We'd store that in the database because that printer software uses the ding as its way of saying I'm done sending you data. Or I could store an escape character to tell it, hey, something special is coming now. That's when you use a, a blob. I actually don't even include blobs on the slide anymore because, well, I just try to tell people don't use them. But there's always somebody who asks that question, so that's why I'm okay answering it because it's a valid question. Okay, so those are the common data types you will see. So when you're doing a physical diagram, you have some considerations you want to include. Okay, composite attributes should be broken down into their component pieces. For example, a conceptual attribute of an address would become, for example, address one, address two, city, region, region being province, state, county, chome, whatever you want it to be, uh, postal code, because pretty much every country has a postal code, except for some Polynesian countries, because they only have an island. Um, and then usually a country will have, you know, the pieces. Um, try to make the data types and size reflect what's actually being stored. You don't need 255 characters for a phone number. Just saying. And then often I'll have people say, well, if you're using a VAR car, why not use 255? When you're designing the database, you want it to reflect the data you're storing. Just because you can use lots and lots of space doesn't mean you should use lots and lots of space. When somebody looks at your raw database, the data type should give an indication of what goes into it. It's a hint. Um, and then if you're using systems that have like what they call an ORM, like a, like a framework of some sort, an ORM is an object relational mapping tool. It knows based on the structure of the database, how much room is allowed to go into the field. So therefore, if the field's defined as VARCAR 15, example, phone number, 
and you try to feed in 25, it's going to give you an error because it says it's not a valid phone number. Um, so you tried to stick to generic data types as much as humanly possible. Why? It allows portability. A var car exists in MySQL. It exists in Microsoft SQL Server. It exists in Access. It exists in uh, Postgres. It kind of exists in Oracle. It's just called something else, but it exists. On the other hand, if you create a data type and it's a MAC address, MySQL doesn't have MAC addresses. I don't even know if Oracle has MAC addresses. Oracle has very few data types, actually. They just keep reusing the same ones. Um, my point about date and date time being the same thing. Um, but if you stick to generic, it's easier if you suddenly have a client that says, hey, you wrote this application, you spent three years writing it, I want it to run a Microsoft SQL server instead of Postgres. If you use custom data types, there's a lot of re-engineering. If you use generic ones, just minor adjustments. Avoid storing sensitive data whenever possible. Unless you have to, absolutely have to, don't store credit cards, don't store SIN numbers, don't store things that help you steal someone's identity. Um, and if you have to store it, encrypt it. There's rules about that stuff, um, especially if you process credit cards. Uh, it's called the PCI standardization, and they 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 will fine your company like tens of thousands of dollars if you don't follow the rules. So, for example, if you're going to store a person's credit card, you don't store the credit card, you store like the last four digits. So that person knows what card they used, but there's no way to reconstruct the person's credit card number. If you need to store the SIN number, you encrypt it. So that way, you need to have the keys to unlock it and actually view the content. And you want to use reference tables as much as possible. Uh, you may have known them also as lookup tables. Um, one example that a lot of people will see is a person's title, you know, Mr., Mrs., Miss, blah, 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 doctor, whatever. Um, this is actually a UI thing more than a database thing, although it's good to do it in the database because, you know, it's managed. But one of the things I learned when I went through school and I didn't believe the prof until I went into the real world and I realized he was right. Users are stupid. Always assume your user has the intelligence of a turnip and then realize the turnip is still smarter than your end user. Don't let them type anything in if you can help it. Do drop downs, do radio buttons, do select lists. Don't let them type anything unless you have to. It keeps your data clean. So using reference tables allows the system administrator to define the allowed values that the end user can pick. Um, an example of I've had to deal with this is when I started working for a company called Click Technology, that was 24 years ago, uh, I inherited the database behind their public website. Now, 24 years ago, websites were really sketch. Um, we didn't even have HTTPS. You know, things were pretty sketch back then. But they allowed freeform text entry into their province slash state field and into the country field. Now you think, well, that can't be that bad. Okay, so we had people in Ontario. They put in Ontario. They put in ON. They put in ONT. And then I got to run a query grabbing everybody in Ontario. So I have to find all the different versions of Ontario while eliminating everything else. It was painful. And then we have the countries. France, France. It's written the same. Thank goodness. Americans, on the other hand. USA, U.S. Dot, dot, dot. United States, United States of America. America. So if just Americans, we'd have like seven different versions of the name of their country. Yeehaw. Dan's got to find every one of these when they want to run a report. You know that one of the very first things I did? I sat down with the guy who wrote the website and I slapped him. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I wanted to. I was still being politically correct at that point in my life. And 
I said, okay, can we put drop downs for these? I will take care of all the database work. I can get it done in like three days. And the drop downs aren't even using proper reference tables, like, you know, with a primary key and a, you know, a name field it was literally just one field with what the people were allowed to select. It was all a primary key. So each value could only go in once, which was cool. Until I found out that we had states in different countries that were called the same thing. But that was a different problem that I had to deal with at that point. Um, but that was cool. That, that worked. Um, yes, use reference tables whenever you can. It's just not a good time if your data gets messy. All right. So common attribute design. So when you, def so you got fields and you got specific kinds of fields. <clears throat> There's some advice that I can give you. Names. So if you're doing a first name, last name, give them 50 characters. I know it sounds really dumb, but have you seen some of the names in Quebec? Last names in Quebec? Like Boudreau-Goudreau? That's a really long freaking last name. Takes up a lot of room. That's, you know, over 20 characters, just the person's last name. Just give it extra room. If it's a combined one, you know, give it like 75. That's probably pretty safe. Email, give at least 100 characters. And people wonder why, Dan, why do you need 100 characters for an email address? Going back to my days at digital, I inherited a call tracking system. Email address was defined as 45 characters. First, the guy who wrote it had just left the company. And he says, 45 is more than enough. That lasted about a month after I started. So the software was for a division called UAS, User Application Support, or also known as Universal Application Support. People argued what it was actually called. Essentially what happened is digital would sell a lot of computers to a big organization. For example, Ottawa Hospital bought all their computers from digital at one point. If you bought so many computers, you were given so many hours of free tech support for your applications per month. So you'd be, you'd pick up the phone at the hospital because, you know, word just shit the bed. Common occurrence of that back then. And you'd just dial an extension. And it would just, you know, you'd connect to tech support. The thing was that it would actually dial the call center in Bell's Corners. And one of our agents would answer the phone. And he would tell them, oh, this is somebody from the Ottawa hospital, so this is the script you're going to use to talk to them. Cool. So we had a uh, client call up, and she worked for the Ministry of Natural Resources in Ontario. And back then, the, the Ontario government was really special with their email addresses because it had their first full name, period, their entire last name, at the department in English, dash the department in French, and not the acronym, dot on dot gov. This lady calls up, and her full name alone, because she actually had the Boudreau Grujo name, that's where that one comes from. So her last name alone was, you know, over 20, was 20 characters. Her first name was like a hyphenated first name. At Resources Naturelles dash Natural Resources, it blew past the forty-five characters like instantly. I had I was at my desk, you know, programming away, and my phone rang, and it's a tech support guy. He goes, "Hey Dan, I can't get a person's email address, and it's giving me an error." I'm like, "Really? Hang on, I'm on my way. Hang up. Go look at their desk. Right, no remote control back then." I'm watching him, and I'm like, "He puts it in. He hits save. Database error." I'm like, "Wait." Send me, email me that, that address. So puts in the email message. I look at it and it was like 70 characters long. All said and done. And I'm like, man, that really sucked back then. Cause really, you know, imagine you had to actually type that in when you've never seen it before. The odds of getting it right were small. So emergency patch time, they put it in the notes and I had to actually edit the application and redeploy it that night. And this was a desktop application. It means it needed to be tested and all that fun stuff. Uh, I was at work till 11 that night because of that. So give it 100 characters for email. 150 is even better, just argument's sake. 
Um, phone numbers. Always use character, don't use numbers. People go, why? Okay. If it's a number, how do you pick a subset of numbers inside of a number? So you want to find everything in area code 613. But it's in an integer. How do you grab the first three characters of an integer? You convert it to text. So if you're going to do that, just store it as text. Because you guys learned about like, right, last semester? The like, the like clause and where? And you, did you learn both flavors of like? You know, with the asterisk and the underscore? No. Somebody said no. So when you do a like, asterisk, oh, it's not asterisk, it's percent sign. Percent sign means zero or more times. The underscore means one character. And there must be a character there. So you can do one character at a time. So if I want to look for a phone number, I can go 613 dash, 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 dash. And therefore, it'll always grab this. Or you can go 613 percent sign. And it'll give you anything that starts with 613. Some systems will want you to store the parentheses. Some of you will want to store periods or dashes. Some of them will want you to put in the plus sign because it's got an international phone number on it. You know, plus 044 because you're calling England. That's the only international prefix I know. Um, so use character fields, at least 14 for North America. That way they can put it in whichever way they want. Uh, money. Don't use money types. And you think that sounds stupid because you're going to store money in the database. Why wouldn't you use one of the money data types? Because money has two places of precision. And most people think, well, money only has two decimal places, you know, 99 cents. How many of you have bought gas this week for your car? Okay, at least at least two people are being honest. I, I, nobody else here owns a car. So when you buy gas, What's the price written as? Right now it's like a buck seventy nine point nine or a buck ninety two point three if you need premium gas. So it's a dollar ninety three three. Three decimal places of precision after the dollar. Most accounting systems keep money at minimum three decimal places, if not four. People go, why? Exchange rates. Accountants like to not lose pennies. And when you do exchange rates, usually most exchange rates are at four decimal places of precision. Therefore, you want to store the exchange rate price at four places of precision so that later on, when you add it all up, you lose less money. It's just fake money because it's all in a computer, but you know, you're losing less money. Money types are lossy. In other words, you lose precision after two because it'll round it automatically to two and you never know what those numbers were after that. Address columns can be challenging. How much room do you need for an address? I usually say 50 to 75 for each piece of the address. So your street address, give it 50, 75. I mean, has anybody here ever seen a German address? They're like that long. Um, postal codes are different depending where you are in the world. Canada, it's six characters. Unless you want to store it in the space, then it's seven. England, same thing, different pattern, but six or seven. Australia, it's five. Some countries only have numbers for a postal code. Therefore, you got to store whatever the maximum number they have. And then you got Americans, again, that were stupid. American postal codes. About 20 years ago, they realized they ran out of postal codes because they said five digits will be enough for everything. Thank goodness other countries looked at the Americans and go, guys, it's stupid. You need more, at least six. <laughs> Anyways, because that six gives you a lot more, right? So it got to the point where a single postal code could be for over a million people or more. There was a postal code in New York, Manhattan. Manhattan had three postal codes for that entire city of like, you know, whatever it was, 20 million people. 
how the hell did mail ever get to someone? So they went from five, they added what they call the postal code, a postal code suffix. So you got the five digits dash, another four digits, which then says this is actually the mail office that's going to route it. They actually had to change their postal codes about 20 years ago. Because there's really poor planning. So postal codes are challenging. Location names can be long or short. Addresses are just challenging. In England, you need two cities, two cities, because of how some other addresses are written. You'll have, you know, some some shire near some other shire. That's literally how I'm. I thought somebody was joking because we had a UK office, and the guy was joking was telling me, "Yeah, we don't have enough room to put in a person's uh, full town name." I'm like, "Dude, the it's the city name is like 35 characters." He goes, "Yeah, I know it's this," and it's like. But I'm like, okay, how about two city names? He goes, that's pretty much how we do it here. <laughs> so, you know, uh, region, state, province, and country should use the full name or use the ISO code. Most people don't realize it, but every state, region, province, and or country has an ISO code. Ontario, it's ON. Canada is CA. China is CN for the country. And there's a three, two character version and a three character version of all of these too, just for, you know, making things complicated. Use the short, use the, I usually recommend using the ISO code because that's safe. Um, if you can, don't let them type anything in and use a reference table. So you just pick the right one. That way everybody's happy until, you know, somebody goes to pick their country from the list and it doesn't exist in the list. Because their country just changed names for the third time in four years. Uh, Myanmar, for example. Or their country no longer exists. You know, regional area formerly known as Yugoslavia. Which is now Croatia, Serbia, Montenegro, and I think it's split up again. The countries come and countries go. Your lists will change. Um, yeah. Okay. So, that's the physical side of the deal. Now I'm going to diagram last week's results into a physical diagram for you, just so you can see what it looks like. Okay. Drop this, and we go. Here's the results of last week, which I forgot to upload. Man, I hope I remember to upload it this week. Um, and I'm going to use Vertebello, because, you know, that's what I'm asking you guys to use. I have purged my Vertebello, so it's nice and virgin, just like all of yours should be now. And I'm going to create a new diagram, and I'm going to do a physical data model. And I'm going to hit next, and I'm going to call this uh, Lecture 4. And I'm going to leave it like this. And what's cool is it will let you pick what database engine you want to use. We're on MySQL, so we're going to use MySQL. Start modeling. Said start modeling. Oh, hang on. Ad blocker. Let me reload that. Man, this was working too not long ago. Wait. There we go. Let's try that again. Next. Uh, lecture four. MySQL. Start. Why am I feeling I've got something that's. I want empty. Start. This was working. I've even had people submit their work with this. Hello? Okay. Complete reload. Oh no, something went wrong. Hey, I know what's going on. I was getting an error about my tab expiring earlier when I was setting up. Maybe I should have paid attention to that. I think there's servers having a problem today. That's fun. Yeah, I was getting an error for that. 
And what is this guy? Oh, look at this now. It's showing up here. Okay, let's try this again. Yeah, I th think their system's having a problem today. Or the college is having a problem. There it goes. Oh, that's so slow. That's got to be the college. I was you literally using it today for to, for an example for someone else at work, and it was like on my three gig fiber connection. And wow, that's not what I wanted. Okay, let's go back to my documents. Be slow. Okay, let's close this one. Let's go with this one. My other choice is Firefox. I refuse to use Chrome. Historically, Edge has been fine for me. This is a networking thing. I know, but it doesn't have all the extra Chrome crap. Come on. Oh, that is that is definitely network. This is not a good uh, not a good look. Oh yeah. 1.5 seconds, 1.56 seconds. Yeah, yeah, it's network. Okay. And that has the example also. All right. Let's go back to my documents again. Close this. I'm going to create another document. I'm going to try it one more time. Next, L4, MySQL, empty, start. I'm not just going to, I'm just going to wait for it. And if this doesn't work, I'm going to switch out another program just so I can show you guys. But I wanted to show it in Vertibello because it makes sense to show it in Vertibello because that's what you guys are supposed to be using. Come on. Eventually. There's the error message. There's L4. Okay. It's always when you try to do a demo. Come on. Do it for Dan. And. It's trying really hard. There it goes. Whew. There you go. Good. So, some of the things you see in this UI. Add a table. Add a relationship. Uh, add a view and some other stuff. All right. So I'm going to add a table. Click on this. I'm going to plunk it somewhere on my diagram. Fantastic. And we have... Um, no, not here. So we have author and genre. So let's start with author. It's this one here. So this is my table over here. I can give it a name, author. And I'm going to add some columns. So we got ID and it's an integer. It's the primary key. And it has the options for a few other things in here like auto increment and that kind of stuff. Um, so it auto increments, that's fun. I'm going to add another column, and that's the author's name. And it's going to be a Varkar 50 for the name. Hey, guys, at the back, a little less talking. I can't speak your language, but I can hear every word you're saying. Okay, so I added my two columns. Great. That's just a placeholder. So you replace a percentage sign with uh, with an actual size. So I'm going to add another one, which is genre. And I'm going to add a column. And again, that's the... Okay. Tab expired. Reload. Yeah, they're having problems today. This was working great before. Let's see if it lost what I just did. Because, 
if it's lost everything I just did, I'm just going to switch to another design tool and This is a product you can actually buy, by the way. <laughs> Come on, just load. But yeah, I've never seen it be this bad. Okay, so it did that. So let's go add my genre table. It gave an error because it was trying to change my stuff. All right, so I'm going to add a column. It's going to be ID once again. It's the primary key. I'm going to make it auto increment. And I'm going to add another column. And that's the, I'm going to call it genre name. Like this. And it's a Varkar 50. Save. OK. Uh, now we're going to add a book. And now if we recall over here, man, I'm really brave just switching out. This is many to many, and this is many to many. Remember, you can't do many to many in a database. So how do you resolve the many to many? You add an associative entity in the middle. First things first, I'm going to add my columns to my book. Book ID, that's our primary key. Auto increment. Uh, book name, and that's a Varkar. Going to give it 100 characters because I've seen some very long book names over the years. Okay, so that's the two, uh, book title. Sorry, not book name. Book title. There, like that. All right, so here's my initial tables. I'm going to add in my social entities now. So this is going to be um, book author. Uh, this one's going to be uh, book genre. And I'm going to be uh, that person. That's just going to use an intersect table. So we do a new reference. Now I got to remember if it's click on the parent, then click on the child. Yes. And then I'm going to do it again. Book to here. Genre to here book to here. All right, now, right now these are intersect tables are not complete intersect tables uh, because the columns are not part of the primary key. So we'll make them part of the primary key. And do the same thing here, which should look familiar to what I had up on the board earlier. So now we have a way to associate a genre to multiple books and have a book to have multiple genres. The author can have, write multiple books and a book can be written by multiple authors. And it's handled by this situation. Now I am going to add in uh, my borrowers. I think that's what I called it. Borrower. Yeah. Okay. And I'm going to add. A borrower ID, it's the primary key. And I'm going to make it auto increment. Yeah, you will notice that when uh, you guys submit this, I won't be able to tell if you made it auto increment. I'm just going through the motions because that's what I normally do. Um, I'll add the uh, borrower name. And again, that's going to be a Varkar. And we're going to give it 75 because we're only having the one field saved like that. And now we need one more associative entity, which would be the, uh, call it the lend table. And we are going to add, oops. Like that. And when we look at this diagram, we know there's a borrow date and return date. So these are the primary key. And now we're going to put in the uh, borrow date, which is some people are going to wonder why I'm going to pick date time. And I'm going to explain that in a minute. Save. And I'm going to add one more column, which is the return. Uh, just call it return. 
And I'm going to also use date time for this. Save. Okay. Hit save. And I hope I don't lose my diagram. Um, yeah, hang on. I'm just going to go and go shoop so I don't lose it completely. Yes, I took a screenshot, didn't save the diagram. It's the fastest way right now for me to make sure I don't lose it. Uh, what did you say about the name being an int? Where? Oh, yeah, that should be a varcar. See, that's when it crashed. I had, I'd already set the type to, and then it went away. All right, so that's gonna be a varcar 75 for the author, not 76, 75. Hit save. Okay, and I'm gonna take another screenshot. Just so I don't lose this. Good enough. Okay. Now, let me explain. Okay, well, anyways, a few nifty things about this tool. You'll notice that it created the foreign keys automatically. It named them automatically, which is cool. Saves you a bit of typing. Uh, your wherever you work may not follow these naming conventions, so you'll still probably have to adjust it. It also carried across the correct data type. Yes. Not quite, but that's that's close to the idea. So when people track data, whenever you have the option to put in a date, always put in the time also. It occupies very little extra database space. Make sure my battery wasn't dead. It occupies very little database space and you get to answer the question, when did things happen? Not what day did it happen on, when did it happen? So if you're capturing the date and the time, it's easy to strip off the time and just show a date because that's just formatting. So imagine that in this system, suddenly, you know, some manager, politician wants to know, so at the library, we will lend out books. What's the most popular time of day that people come? So we make sure that we have enough staff on time. If you're only storing the date, how do you know when books are being checked out? On the other hand, you can run metrics on the date time to find out when during the day people come to the library to borrow books, and you can make sure there's extra librarians on staff. Same thing with the return. Are all the returns showing up roughly, you know, in the morning? That means people are dropping off books at night after the library closes. On the other hand, some people are bringing in the books during the day and they're getting checked in right away. Therefore, you can track the trends of when people are doing stuff, when you track date and time. Online ordering, same thing. You want to track when people take place orders so you know what the pattern is during the day. Um, place I left, I was working at recently, place I just left like six months ago, just feels like yesterday, but it's like six months ago. Uh, we regularly ran metrics to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? We would run the metrics so that we could see how quickly people started buying our software after we sent out a mailer. So we sent out an email blast to all 48,000 of our customers that have not upgraded recently. And then we start watching the online store to see, you know, on average, how quickly the pickup of buying stuff. And we could see through the day, the trends of when people were receiving the email and buying upgrades. Managers care about that stuff. Accounts kind of care about that stuff. Did the sales rep really care? No, he just cared the money was coming in. But don't make your data lossy. If you can add a, use up an extra two bytes of data of space so you can give proper metrics. It's fantastic. And most people don't realize like this date time is precise to, in most database systems, is precise to like microseconds. Not, it's not like, oh, it happened at 1059 and 36 seconds. It's actually got dot and four digits after that for the microseconds. So you know the moment the person gave you their money. <laughs> that very microsecond that you took their money. This space it uses? 
yeah, how much disk space it's going to use. Uh, different database servers will do it differently. Uh, it all depends. MySQL will let you do it, um, amongst other things. Uh, Postgres has it in their admin tools. Normally, the 100% uh, guaranteed way to get the real truth is to drop to the file system and actually look at how much room that directory takes where the data is stored. Uh, Oracle's really good at giving you the actual data. Um, uh, in the admin tools, um, you can normally see it. Uh, if I go MySQL Workbench, I'm going to come back to the diagram in a second just so I can answer your question. Uh, under administration, schemas. Actually, I'm not sure if I can actually see it through this. Um, Is this? There we go. Um, this has three rows, 68 bytes per row. Um, yeah. That's roughly the info it gives you. Uh, if I look at the database, it's occupying 10K because <laughs> this database is almost empty. If I grab this database, on the other hand, uh, it's occupying 14.5 megabytes. Well, it depends on the tool you're using. It just depends. All right. So over here, that's with data in it. Right? So you can actually just export a raw database structure and see how much room that takes. The the, the only thing that's missing on this, hang on, is my name. Because that's very important when you submit your work. That was the uh, add a new note. And then you go to export it. Um, you can export an image. And you pick whatever you want. And you go generate. I've noticed sometimes the export's really good. And sometimes the export's really bad. Um, and apparently it's really slow today. So you, I guess screenshot might do the job better. I just don't need the entire thing. I just need the working area. I don't need to see the rest of the UI. This usually, like, last time I did this was like this. Eh? Is it pardon? Yeah, there it goes. It shouldn't be this slow, but this is how I, this is for lab four. Lab four, yeah, the one where you do the conceptual diagram, then the physical diagram. And I just, did I actually hit download? I don't know why Vertebello is that slow. Maybe it's not that slow for you guys. Also, it could be my machine that's acting up. Uh, my machine... It's slow for you guys too. So, and there it is, exported. And if it didn't save my note, my A, my note didn't make it in, even though it's in the diagram because it hadn't saved it yet when I tried to export it. Um, you know, it's saving on Vertebello. Um, let me close this. You notice this little icon here. When I move this, it changes color and then it just turned blue. That's it saving it in the background. Once it's not blue anymore, then probably it's saved. Normally, like I said, it's usually not this slow. So I don't know what's happening today. Um, could be the college as well as anything else. Um, the other cool part of this tool is you can export it as SQL. So if I hit this button, which I don't expect you guys to do, but I hit generate, who knows how long this is gonna take the way it's acting. Like this normally should take like 10th of a second. And last time I did it, it took 10th. Wow, that was pretty good. Download. Save. And yeah, and you can take the SQL and copy paste it into MySQL and run it. And it'll create your table. It includes your constraints, your foreign keys, your primary keys. You can see it's all auto increment. So you can use this tool to generate your SQL, which is nice. Yep. Do that again. I hit the SQL export button and I tell it to create. I can tell it to do a drop amongst other things and go generate. A. Or you can create views in this if you want. 
or if you're actually using like a proper database system. So the other cool part of this is I can convert this to a different database engine using the exact same thing. And as long as I'm not using anything that's specific to MySQL, it'll actually do the conversion for you. Also, this is usually instant, but we know there's performance issues today. Come on. I'm waiting for this blue icon to go away. Oh, wow, that was actually better. I hit SQL. Um, it has not realized it's not MySQL. It's still MySQL. Oh, there it goes. It had to reload it to make it uh, Postgres. Now, if I go SQL, there's errors, warnings, data type not because Postgres doesn't have date time. It has. Um, It actually uses something called timestamp and it's not letting me type. Hello. Probably have to close it and reopen it. Um, they're having problems today, obviously. Oh, there it goes. There we go. They have timestamp. Save and Time to stamp save. And you can see they've got some other interesting data types in here. Timestamp save and save. Wait for the blue icon to go away. And you'll see the difference between it, MySQL and another database engine. And that's why you want to use generic data types as much as humanly possible. Like that was what two fields I had to change to make it work. So now if I go generate the SQL and I go generate. Um, and if I'm using Postgres, I go download, save, and I go grab this guy, which is the new one. And now it's doing the um, Postgres version of all the fields. So, cool beans. So it does work, just be patient. Except we can tell when you use a tool. Because humans will not usually write the SQL the same way a machine will generate it. Uh, fair enough, because I've had students when and I teach one of the other courses I teach where they learn SQL after the design stuff. And I go, you got to handwrite it. You can't use a design tool. How do you know? I can tell just how you create your foreign keys. Yeah, you could use this to do it, theoretically. With the prof notice, who knows? Uh, if for somebody that actually knows their stuff, yes, they'd notice. And the fact that if you have six people that submit the exact same file, identically, uh, because it, you notice the note wasn't included in it. So there's no identifying carrot comments in it to see who did it. Um, but this in theory should now hopefully generate with my name on it. Now it's saved. But yeah, that's how you do a physical diagram. The different tools will do it slightly differently. You know, MySQL Workbench will do it in Crash, but Crash very badly. If you're in MySQL Workbench on a Mac, you won't have any icons because that's a bug. <laughs> And you have no icons on your toolbars. You have to know the keyboard shortcuts to use a Mac with MySQL Workbench. Uh, Oracle's designer is gross. So download this. Come on, just download. Download. There it goes. It's just slow today. Oh, I didn't keep my name. Cool. That sucks. Take give give me a screenshot, apparently. I don't know why it's not including my name. Because that's there, but it's not just, just not being exported. Interesting. That's fine. As long as that's your work, I'm okay with it. All right. So that was literally the end of the physical design side of the deal. You know, I talked about how to resolve the relationships, considerations for data, 
You watched me struggle with the design tool because the website's running like molasses in January. Um, any questions before I let you guys go? What's a synthetic key? It's, for example, when I hit the auto increment option. Yeah, synthetic key is a surrogate key. The proper database terminology is a surrogate key. But often the people will use synthetic key because that's what their prof taught them. <laughs> but the, the real word is surrogate key. Is it surrogate key because it's a, it's like when you have a surrogate parent, you know, it's not really the child's parent, but the parent takes the child anyways kind of thing. That's why it's a surrogate key. It's because it's a key that's been adopted from outside itself. Well, that's the point of a synthetic key, is that it has no real-world meaning. It's usually a number. It's generated by the database engine so that it's self-managed. And the other thing, a good thing about synthetic keys that are auto-generated by the database is you, you don't have to trust the programmer to do it right. Because as a both a developer and a database architect, I never trust the programmer. I've done, <laughs> I've, I've been on both sides and... I wouldn't trust myself to code it right. So that that's really encouraging when I say it like that. But, you know, it's just if it's the database enforcing the rule, then you, the developers don't need to worry about it. And it's one less feature they have to worry about. Otherwise, you have to use, like, find the max value, increment it by one, save, hope nobody else used that number while you're doing it, handle it. Otherwise, you just let the database do it for you. So much better. These are the social entities. You create the intersect table and you just drop in the foreign keys. Now, so this isn't an intersect table. These are intersect tables. This is an associative entity. Yeah. yeah, that's literally the only difference between an intersect table and a associative entity. The associative entity has extra columns. When you click it, it'll create the foreign keys for you. And then you just mark them as, like, right now they'll come in looking like this. And then you just mark them as primary keys. They're just regular tables. I just created a relationship. So if I if I get rid of this relationship, column goes away, I drag and drop, it comes back in, and I come here and I go, oh, come here, I go down to that column and I mark it as part of the primary key. That's it. Fairly straightforward. Software is actually self-explanatory and they actually have help files. So if you're not sure how to do something, the help files actually show you a lot of it. These guys got entire tutorials on database design on their website. So it's good. All right. Any other questions before I end the day? Going once, going twice. 